Thomas More is a very, very important figure, and we will come back to him, but he's one of Henry VIII's chief, chief advisors. But there is no other guy when it comes to Christian humanism like this dude. Desiderius Erasmus. And for those of you who truly read that book, if you truly read Ross King's um, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, you remember this name, right? Desiderius Erasmus was one of the original critics of the church, right? Desiderius Erasmus in 1520 is a Dutch, well, he's Flemish, but like Dutch basically in a sense, thinker. And his first name, Desiderius is his first name. D-E-S-I-D-I-R-U-S, -I -I -S, Desiderius, right? So Erasmus believed a lot of things that really shook the bedrock of, what you call it, of um, Christianity in general, right? He actually popped up in like 1520 more than anything else after Martin Luther's Reformation had began, but he had started his career way earlier than that. So you know what? Just kind of scribble that or delete that year out of there. It's not that important because the big thing that's important of him is like some of his texts and some of the things that he wrote and mostly the things that he said, right? So the big thing about Erasmus is he was very, very critical of a lot of different ideas, right? He was the guy that kind of inspired Martin Luther to start being more critical of the church and stuff like that. He advocated for childlike views of Christianity. He said that we should not be living our lives like trying to have a checklist into heaven. We should have an open faith with the Lord and then we should be communal and then we should just try to live our best life, right? There should not be rules and regulations that are saying you are going to get into heaven faster than they are going to get into heaven. And so he advocated for this, this concept. He wanted all biblical text also to be translated into vernacular languages. He said the fact that priests are the only people that can read the Bible is disgusting. The fact that they are the only ones that know how to read Latin, how are we supposed to teach children how to read if they can't read the book that is only commonly copied at this time? Translate these things into different languages. And he actually defied the church when he did it first, when he translated it into Greek, right? So he translated it into Greek so he could easily spread it amongst the humanist community because many of them were learning how to like read Greek so they could translate certain Greek works, right? So the big thing also is he believed that education leads to reform. Live like Christ. Don't checklist your life, right? And he espoused all these things in a book that he wrote, and you need to jot this book down, okay? This book was called The Praise of Folly, right? P-R-A-I-S-E of folly, F-O-L-L-Y. And in this book, he advocates for all these concepts, you know what I mean? But he also then also begins to poke fun at the church hierarchy. Okay? So I don't know if you remember this from the book, but there was a, a point where there was an image in the book of Julius II standing out front of heaven with a list of his sins waiting to get in while other people were allowed to go, right? Basically saying that Julius II, the Pope at the time, was a bad person that did not deserve immediate entrance into heaven because he did not live a life the way he was supposed to. That's what he said. Erasmus is the guy that said that, and he wrote that, and he had that drawn up and put into a pamphlet-like form and distributed around. Erasmus criticized Julius II heavily for his things that he did, hoarding money for the church, spending it on things that he didn't need to spend money on, going and conquering other people. He's the first one that called Julius II the warrior pope, right? Fighting wars and having people killed in the name of growing your papal state boundaries, right? Erasmus, massive critic, super intense dude. Dude, very, very important, all right? So, like, highlight him, star him, very important. Now, another big thing, though, that comes into play here is women's role in the Renaissance, right? Alberti, of course, that guy, Leon Battista Alberti, said that women's key skills were the following. And he is the Renaissance man. He's like the Renaissance man humanist. He can do all kinds of stuff, right? Alberti said that women should be good at serving meals, supervising servants, educating children, and I, why am I not surprised that he never got married? Now, ironically enough, Alberti was single for his entire life, and he never actually got married. And we wonder why, because he believes that women should only have roles that are sedentary and completely confined to a household, right? Now, anyway, he's an idiot. Now, anyway, he might be super smart, and he might be a cryptographer and stuff like that, but he apparently does not have any people skills. So the big thing, though, is that the Renaissance is going to leak to the female class anyway. Because making things that are vernacularly available for women to read, imbibe, and go forward with 
it's going to occur, right? So some believed that education for women was actually very, very good, right? There were growing phylums of nuns that were growing up. They were like, wait, women should be able to read. And you know what? Alberti might be a tool, but he's not wrong about one thing. Women should be in charge of educating children. And because we're there, we're their mothers, and there's not schools or elementary schools for these children yet, right? There's not these higher order thinking places for the children yet. So I should be able to teach them how to read. And if they need to know how to read, I need to know how to read. And if I can read, I can also learn, right? So the idea that women in educational systems was a good thing really began to grow in the Renaissance and actually began to quietly stir the pot of women being able to have access to educational thought. Many thought that... Like some other Renaissance thinkers are like, oh, education for women is going to lead to have them having too much action. They're going to do too much. So there were two different ideas popping around. But this woman is considered one of the best examples of why you should educate, educate women in the Renaissance. This is Isabella Diesti, known as the First Lady of the Renaissance, right? Her letters to friends and family showcased her ability as a highly educated and adept Renaissance woman, right? You have to understand that she defied the norms of the time. Isabella Diesti learned to read, read everything she could get her hands on, and became a part of this thing that was known as the Republic of Letters, right? So write down the Republic of Letters. And then I want you to write it down over there in the margins, though, like somewhere over here on the right side. And I want you to draw a, a letter or a thing on the Republic of Letters. We draw an arrow going up to Erasmus and an arrow going to Esty and then an arrow going to Sir Thomas More. So many Renaissance humanists were a part of this thing known as the Republic of Letters, where they would write down their ideas and send them to to people and people will be like, huh, okay, well, here's what I think about that idea and send it off. Machiavelli was a part of his own Republic of Letters and it wasn't a centralized thing when you didn't send it to the Republic House and they sent it out to somebody else. It just went and bounced around and so you had your ideas reviewed and like corrected and debated and things like that in the with the style that was the most appropriate, which was to like write to one another, right? And Isabella Diesti wrote so many letters to friends and family and it showed her ability to critique things. She said, how to do things correctly, where society was going wrong. And she had thoughts of her own. She was an independent, intense woman, right? And she was highly educated. She eventually even began to rule over a small area of Italy. A small kingdom fell under her command completely. She is one of the very first female leaders of Europe ever because her husband went insane and then eventually died. And she actually ruled over the small area of Romagna in Italy. By herself. She was like, what's up, what's up, what's up? And then she did a great job and the people did not dethrone her because she was the first lady of the Renaissance, right? This woman, Isabella Diesti, is like the prototype for what Christine de Pizan advocated for. Now, this is really important, okay? Christine de Pizan would look at Isabella Diesti as one of the best examples of a Renaissance woman. Because Christine de Pizan had written about why, uh, what a Renaissance woman should be. And she would hold up Isabella Diesti as being a great example of one. So she is the very first female vernacular writer. Christine de Pizan is actually also Italian, and she used her literary abilities to make money. She would review things for people. She would actually correct certain items. She would read and translate different things for people. But eventually, she became somebody that was very important in their community. And she then wrote a book known as The Book of the City Ladies. And what this did is it became the tome of why you should believe women should be educated, right? It wrote contrary to Alberti's opinion, saying, no, women should be educated because it is the great equalizer, right? If you give women an education, they will educate their children and they will have more to do and more to say in their society. And she could point to Isabella Diesti and be like, see, that's what I'm talking about right there. So do me a favor and highlight the book of City Ladies because this became a very widely read and a widely... Printed book during this time. You have to understand that all of this stuff hinges around the invention of one particular thing. Let's look at something really, really fast, and then we're going to wrap this whole thing up because this part doesn't take much time. Petrarch versus Erasmus. All right, so now look, talking about Christine de Pizan, Isabella d'Esti, Desiderius Erasmus, Sir Thomas More in his book, things like that, things like that. The Prince, Machiavelli. 
we really don't even have to necessarily just put Erasmus right here. We could actually say Dante and Petrarch versus Erasmus, Machiavelli, Sir Thomas More, Christine de Pizan, etc. So your earliest humanist versus your later humanist. But let's look at these two guys just to make this example a little bit easier. Petrarch um, wrote his tome, The Ascension of Mount Venu. He wrote uh, like several different works. And with his translations, though, Petrarch's stuff didn't travel very fast. His stuff came out in the 1350s and spread very slowly person to person. Okay, So people would be able to walk up to somebody and be like, oh, well, I have this thing Petrarch wrote. Not specifically, but someone copied it for me. Notice what I said. They copied it for me. Legit, they copied it for me. And then you had to, every time you wanted to distribute another text, had to have it copied. Like, check this out. First work of the Divine Comedy. Look at this copy of the Divine Comedy. This legit is one of the earliest known texts of the Divine Comedy, right here, okay? It was created and actually made, we believe, in the late 1300s. This bad boy is completely handwritten, all right? So if you wanted to read the Divine Comedy, read the word of Petrarch, read the word of early humanists, you had to find someone who was willing to copy a book by hand. This is why there were so many copies of the Bible floating around due to the fact, like look at this one, this is another one too. They also all had hand-drawn illustrations in them, little filigrees laid out on the outside. Books were considered works of art in the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance because they were so expensive. Look at the map of hell right here in this early work of the Divine Comedy. You gotta understand, that is why Dante's and Petrarch's ideas did not catch fire and spread super quickly until the like later 1400s because you had to have an excessive amount of money to be able to access them. This is a piece of art. It took a long time to make. There were so many copies of the Bible because monks used to take vows of silence, and in those vows of silence, they would just sit there and copy Bibles to other Bibles, right? Like So they would just be like, oh, I'm on John again, blah, 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 blah. and they would just do that for expansive times on end. But Petrarch and Dante didn't have access to a tool that Erasmus and many others did. And that tool is known as the printing press, right? I know right now Angelina Murphy is just freaking out right now because she loves the concept of this thing because it makes everything make so much sense. The printing press is probably the most important invention to come out of the late Renaissance period, or excuse me, the high Renaissance period than any other one, right? The printing press or Gutenberg's press, is going to be created by a metalsmith and goldsmith by the name of Johannes Gutenberg. Funny enough, though, he stole the idea. Now, let's discuss this for a hot second. Remember when we talked about the Eastern Golden Age? We'll review that again a little bit in class. We talked about the Eastern Golden Age. We talked about how Southeast Asians, the Arabs, all these the uh, West or East Coast Africans were making a ton of money. The Islamic kingdoms were making a ton of money, and they were also spreading their ideas and stuff like that. Funny enough, with economic prosperity comes technological innovation. Technology like this had already existed for several hundred years, right? The Asians had actually made printing presses long before the European models came out. This right here is examples of some of their types. Now, we'll get to types here in a second, okay? But the thing about Johannes Gutenberg, okay, that's his name actually, Johannes Gutenberg, is he actually just differentiated his press a little bit differently and he called it, or he made it out of metal. The only downfall to the original Asian designs of printing presses with that, all the types were made out of wood, right? And since they were made out of wood, they only had certain access to them because they had to all be hand carved, okay? So the way a type works or what a type is, imagine a Scrabble tile, right? A Scrabble tile has one letter on it, okay? That is what you would call a type, okay? Just like why when you're on your keyboard, for those of you who are typing your notes, that's why it's called typing because each of the letters are called types. You are typing it, right? That's why it's called a type writer because it slaps a metal S into a ribbon and presses the ink onto paper, right? So that is why it's called typing or a type, all right? So when you do a press, you have to take all these types and run them together. If you want to make a sentence, if I want to say, Mr. Terry smells like cheese, I would have to take an M, put it there, an R, put it there, a period, put it there, a T, put it there, like da, 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 and I would line the entire thing up, including spaces, and then rub ink on it and then press it down. The only hard part about it is, is if you make yours out of wood, like the original Asiatic models, the wood degrades. 
it rots. It like it soaks the ink up. It's not as proliferated. Whereas Gutenberg's metal press was designed to be the very first type, as in specific lettering, printing press, right? We just explained what types were. And it was made out of metal, so it didn't degrade nearly as fast, right? Now, ironically enough, though, Gutenberg's press only caught fire because of everything else that had been going on. Gutenberg got lucky, all right? So Gutenberg is considered to be one of the most prominent figures and one of the biggest people in all of European history because, oh, he made the printing press, brah, 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 which is debatable, right? And the reason why it's called a press, though, is because legit, after you laid all the types up and stuff, you would take these things that look like maracas and dip them in ink and go dip, 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 and then you would literally just go crank and crank this thing down, it would go smush. It was like a big stamp, and then you would pull that off and you would do another page, and then pull that off and do another page and do it all, like, it's very, very simple. The interesting part about it is Gutenberg only got successful because paper making had become so much more efficient, right? So the Chinese and the Muslims in Spain had actually learned how to make paper faster and they sold excessive amounts of it to the Europeans, right? So the big thing about it is literacy because of this exploded. So ironically enough, when you really, really look at it, Gutenberg, put a little star next to this, Gutenberg's not that important. Gutenberg's press is not that important. If somebody would have invented it anyway, had the Chinese and the Koreans not invented the first printing press and had the Muslims not made a more efficient paper making system. But because of this printing press and the printing revolution as it's called, but printing revolution, exclamation mark as it's called, literacy would explode. And the very first Gutenberg press, I believe was designed in like 1448, but let me double check on that year real fast. Gutenberg press. Um, really, really quick, apparently it was designed in the, there is no specific date, but we believe that it was somewhere close to the 1440s. Yeah, so the big thing about it though, Gutenberg the man, not that important. The device he used was just a simple upgrade from the stuff that already existed, right? But the very first books would be printed on it. And what do you think the very first book printed on it was? the Bible, right? And the original one that was printed on there, it's called the Gutenberg Bible, and it literally still exists, right? Books are now made by monks, or like books were now made by monks, nuns, and printers. Printers are going to proliferate books much faster. So Praise of Folly by Desiderius Erasmus got out there faster because the printing press was already around and he could print multiple copies, right? Uh, Martin Luther's 95 Thesis gets printed like crazy because it's gonna be easily made now. Also, jot this down, print shops become propaganda centers, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we actually get into class in the next, next class period. I'll talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.